Hello. Welcome, Patrick and Pradumna. How are you? Hello. Um, I'm good. I'm good to be here. Yeah. Yeah. It's good that you are here. Welcome. Pradumna, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing absolutely fine. And it's great to be uh, on live stream and talking with the students and community here. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I am so excited. I love having our fellow student leaders on our stream. I feel like you all have so much insight and so much experience that's relevant and relatable to our audience. Um, so I'm happy to have you and I can't wait to hear what you have to share today. Um, but while folks are jumping on, I'm going to throw, oh, it's already up there. <laughs> we have a caption just reminding you to let us know where you're joining us from. Um, so if you've never been here before, we would love to know where you're coming in from. And to kind of just jump us off and introduce this stream, what we do here is we promote API literacy and API education through a couple of different programs that you can find on our webpage, on the student programs webpage. Um, you can find a link to that webpage actually in the QR code that you see on your screen. But what we offer is free programs that offer digital badges that you can display on your social profiles like LinkedIn and even on your resume. If you're a regular on our student program streams, then you know that you can expect a monthly episode, um, usually during the last week of the month, often on Tuesdays. However, this episode is on a Wednesday. Uh, but what we often do is invite guests to the stream to present a tech talk or have students themselves from our very own student community. Um, and if that's something that you like seeing and want to catch often, please don't forget to mark your calendars for that last week of the month or join us on Discord where we send out a reminder for every episode. So Discord, our join link here is up on your screen. So if you're curious and you wanna join us there, you can copy that link down and join us on Discord to see what the community's up to. Awesome, I see a couple of flames for you folks. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Don't forget to let us know where you're joining us from. I'm going to throw that reminder back up on the screen. And yeah, let's get into some introductions because I'm sure folks are curious who you both are. They've probably seen me around on this stream a couple times. Um, but I'll start with my introduction anyway, in case there's somebody new. My name is Ruby, and I'm a senior developer advocate here at Postman. I'm from Providence, Rhode Island, which is on the US East Coast. Um, so I'm on Eastern time. And I'm coming up on about two years here at Postman as a postmanot in the fall. Um, so let me actually pass this to Patrick first. Patrick, can you share your name, your role in our student community, where you're based out of, and how long you've been in the community? OK, so my name is Patrick Moremi. I'm a student from University of Eldoret. I'm the Postman student leader there. And I'm um, currently in Kenya. I live in Kenya. So, nice. yeah. It looks like we have some folks from Kenya here joining as well. Welcome, welcome. Now, passing it off to Pradumna, can you introduce yourself for our audience? Yeah, sure, sure. So, yeah, I'm Pradumna. I'm from India. I talk about like open source, Go, and DevOps. That's, our, that's our, my niche. And yeah, I love like developing uh, APIs, CLI tools, and more on the automation side of things. Yeah, that's it. And I am from joining from India. Yeah. Nice. Um, so we have our student leader population, also our student expert population, kind of global, right? We have folks from all over the world. Uh, clearly, we have someone here um, who is from Kenya and someone from India. I'm in the US. Um, so we're kind of just scattered around. We have so many different folks. We actually have, fun fact, over 100 student leaders globally. Um, so you might want to remember that for later in the episode. Uh, but kind of shifting gears here, what we always do and what we've been making a habit of doing is kind of going through our student expert training, which we talk about so much. But there are folks, I'm sure, who are curious what the heck we're talking about. So I'm going to go ahead and just show you what that looks like. So this is, sorry, wrong link. What are we discussing? Our student expert training. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly. And that'll be over. Hey, one second. Forgot to hide my toolbar here, or bookmarks bar. And there is our student expert program. So when you log into our web page, you will see basically this kind of landing page, welcoming students to our program or really anybody to our program. 
And when you scroll down, you'll get kind of an, uh, a background as to what kind of education we provide, why our programs are super important for our students and educators, and then all of the different programs we have available. So we have an expert program, a leader program, and a classroom program. Right now, I'm kind of zooming into our expert program. So if you click learn more, you'll be forced down the page. And student experts basically have all of these benefits. They'll get a badge, they get exclusive access to different events. Um, you get to be part of our student expert program community and you'll have access to this free training. So if you select apply to be a student expert, you'll see a web form like this where you'll just quickly fill it out. Again, this is free. I say again, as if I mentioned it before, I don't think I did. This is a free program. Um, and when you sign up, you'll have access to a course where you'll get to earn that API expert uh, badge and certificate. What that course looks like is over here. It's called the Postman API Fundamental Student Expert Certification. You can take a look at the About This Course section. You'll see that you actually don't need to have any background knowledge, that this is super beginner friendly. Um, so easy to enter this kind of program and kind of get started with this curriculum. If you open up the curriculum, one thing I want to point out is it looks like it could be daunting, but it's actually very thorough. And there's lots of examples and screenshots throughout to help you out. If you ever get stuck, it's easy to get some help. We have an FAQ provided to you and you can always email us. We're pretty responsive with that email. We try to get to every one of them within a day. Um, so if you ever get stuck throughout the training, you can email us and let us know what's going on, what you've tried, especially um, and any images that might be helpful for us. So the expert training is very accessible. It's very easy to get into, it's free, and you have help from us. If you would rather not email us, we're also on Discord to help you out with that. We have a student expert training channel. Um, so I'll share that student, ex or student Discord link over here once more. So feel free to join that and get some help from there as well. Awesome, so I will stop sharing this. And just a reminder, let us know where you're joining us from if you're just jumping on. Now we can kind of shift gears into why pra Patrick and Pradumna are here with us. So let me actually change what we're discussing. So for today's episode, I thought it would be really awesome to bring in some of our own student leaders to chat about their experiences in our program and some of the workflows and trends that, they, that have worked for them or that they see value in for fellow students. To start us off though, I'm gonna ask each of you, Patrick and Parimna, some questions, uh, one at a time, so that we can get to know both of you before we dive into some of those great resources that you have ready for us. As we have participants kind of joining in, they can also feel free to share their questions in the chat too. So if you have questions for Patrick and Parimna, throw those into the chat and we'll make sure to ask them. But starting out, let me ask Patrick first, what was it that made you apply for the Postman Student Leader Program? Um, okay, for me, it's a peculiar story <clears throat> because uh, at first, I didn't even know about the Postman Student Programs at all or the Postman interface. I was just curious about APIs at first. So in my endeavors as a web developer, I was curious to what these APIs are because I was seeing they were just links and I'm um, like, this is a URL, it's a domain name, how can it be an API? So I decided to embark on my journey to learn about APIs and on the way, I encountered Postman, the Postman interface, uh, testing and developing APIs. And then I joined the stu Postman student community where I interacted with fellow students and then I got wind of the student programs. And since then, my main motive was to learn more about APIs, and I learned about the student expert program, and I enrolled, I went through it, it was really awesome, a bit challenging, but I'm glad I, I overcame it, and yeah, I got the certif certification. Yeah, so later on, I got interested in the Postman Student Leader platform, uh, because I thought I could share my journey on learning APIs, and try to make it easier for them to learn. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And I I can, oh, got a little bit of an echo there. Apologies. Um, but I can definitely attest to seeing Patrick become a full-fledged leader in our community. I know a lot of folks lean on him for his advice and for his experiences. And it's interesting to hear that you had this like 
organic way of discovering our student programs. Sometimes we hear folks say that they were already looking for student programs and then they stumbled upon Postman Student Community. Um, but you were just interested in APIs at first and learning more about them and then eventually learned about the student community. So that's fascinating. Um, I'm going to pass that same question over to Pradumna. So Pradumna, what was it that made you apply for the Postman Student Leader Program? So uh, this is a really interesting question. Like uh, back in, like when I completed my expert certification, I remember there was an AP test like 2022 in February. So uh, we part participated in the test and interestingly, we won that as well. Like, but at that time I uh, came to know that like this test is completely organized by the leaders. And when I uh, go deep dive into that, like the pulse of the leaders, like everything, like from the uh, event support, from the swag support and everything, this made me like, okay, this is a one step ahead, like from the expert, like passing over knowledge to the community, because when you're expert, you are just concentrating your knowledge to yourself. But when you become a leader, like you are doing for the community, like passing over knowledge to like events, uh, events. And this is interesting. Like recently I hosted the event like API Days Patna. So this was a very first event for me for student leader. So this things like event support and uh, like giving talks like uh, here on the stream as well, like this kind of works really like, uh, because I really love the community part and the uh, representation part, and this is what attracted me. And yeah, uh, this is why I applied, and uh, uh, thankfully I got selected as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's also interesting to hear that it was an event itself that drew you into the program. Um, API Fest, I think, was one that was a huge success, and we got a lot of folks really paying attention to the program after that, including yourself. It sounds like. Um, so yeah, I would agree that having student leaders present and be involved in these things like live streams or speaking events um, really has made a huge difference for our programs and for yourselves, I'm sure, as well. Um, so let me take it off to the next question here. Patrick, what has been the most exciting thing for you at the or about the Postman Student Leader Program so far? So again, what, what's been the most exciting thing about being a Postman Student Leader? Um, for me, it's getting to engage with the community, the learning community, because um, if you go to the Discord channels, uh, it's not all about tech. We have some uh, other channels related to other parts of life. You can have like a music channel, a games channel. So just interacting with everyone, it's really fun and you get to enjoy learning with everyone. Yeah, and I really enjoy the work ethic of the Postman team because yeah, we have a lot of events and hackathons globally, and the Postman team, I think it's a bit limited, but they work hard to ensure everything runs smoothly. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. We do our best to be responsive because uh, we also care about you folks, of course. We are definitely a small team, but we're growing. <laughs> um, and hearing the impact that we have on our student community is definitely rewarding and fulfilling. I love that you all get so involved and so jazzed about being part of a community and having an impact. And that just fuels us even further. So that's exciting. Uh, Pradumna, what do you think? What has been the most exciting thing for you about being a Postman student leader? Yeah, uh, the first thing is the international community. I really love the international community. Like the folks from different, like if you see uh, different communities, they are a bit more concentrated to a certain region or certain kind of people. But if you see the Postman, community it's ranged from student to professional so this is the one of the best part and second thing about itself of the program and itself of the community if you see different programs are more on the marketing aspect of thing but postman student leaders kind of chill kind of program you do your own stuff like uh, building stuff educating stuff and it's not like postman never post you to do like promoting postman 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 no this is not about any program and about the community so yeah this is like good we talk about the literacy and other things, not about the postman itself. We uh, more on the literacy side. So yeah, and like, uh, like uh, the community is really helpful. Like uh, when I fall into like different kinds of issues, like uh, and uh, like testing things, I really like the uh, the leaders and also people are uh, able to like test their products very uh, on the early stage as well. Like this is fascinating. So yeah, like different things like flows, the current AI tools and everything. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Student leaders do get exclusive access to some things sometimes, especially things like beta features in the product. Um, so that's a huge, huge perk. Um, and being able to hear your insight on how things are going is very valuable and directly impacts our product, which is, I think, very empowering for our students to, to know that they have that kind of level of um, 
effect on the product. So awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Pradumna. I have another question here for Patrick. What are some ways that you've been able to engage with communities after hosting your very first event? Um, I've had some few opportunities uh, that I've got to engage with communities. One, I've gotten a chance to help uh, some student leaders in other campuses to host the events. I've also engaged with some of the members of communities by, um, I usually keep my DMs open. You know, Twitter, LinkedIn can freely contact me if have any issues relating to APS. And so I've been receiving some personal requests on the most uh, recommended journey in learning about APS. And I've, yeah, I'm, I've been guiding them nicely and the progress has been, has been good so far. Yeah. Awesome. Pradumna, what do you think? Do you have anything that you want to add to that? Any ways that you've been able to engage with communities after hosting your first event? Uh, I think Patrick already uh, touched upon the points. And the, uh, one thing I really like about the after hosting events, like when I hosted the, my very first event, like lots of people, less, very less people were interesting more on the API side. They are, they are more like concentrated towards the like simply apps. But when I had a talk with people in the event and after the event, I think there's a, a kind of enthusiasm like the about the certification, about the usability of APIs and how they can integrate the, in the app. So I think this is uh, really stands me out like uh, the, the, the person who is no, no, know nothing about the API and now like fascinated about the API, we can implement this. And, and when we uh, tell them the workflow, uh, show them the live demo by doing API 101, they, the, then their perspective of the complication of the API has reduced, drastically, drastically reduced from like, uh, it is very tough. So oh, I can implement this in my, in my app. So yeah, this was the key thing like I really like about after the hosting event. Awesome, that's very true. Um, I find that folks, like you mentioned earlier, we don't really emphasize like promoting Postman really that much. Um, the one thing we really care a lot about is API education, because once you have that, naturally you're gonna be using Postman because we're a developer platform that, help, that helps you interact with APIs. So you're gonna be using Postman anyway. Um, but what we really like seeing is the kinds of projects people build with that knowledge. Um, there's all kinds of interesting things that people are building these days. And we're going to get into a lot of that today, actually, with um, our developer workflow conversation and the trends that we're seeing. Um, so that'll be exciting and a great segue into that. So shifting gears, actually, let me actually switch what our discussion topic is right now. Oh, somebody asked in the chat about the Postman blog. Let me share that link really quickly. So if you're interested in seeing what's available on our blog right now, we actually have a lot of cool product updates um, and posts about those that you can find, about, find out more about on our blog. So that link for the blog is up on the screen right now. And then something else I wanted to share is what we are discussing right now. So we're shifting now back into the developer workflows and trends for students, which is why Patrick and Pradunna are joining us today. So let's get into those workflows and trends and share them with our audience. I have a few trends myself that I would like to share, but I will let our student leaders take the floor on this first. I know, Patrick, you have some slides and things that you want to share and screen share. I'm happy to toggle that on for you if you are ready, Spaghetti. Hmm. Yeah, I am ready. Go and share the screen. Awesome. Yeah, <clears throat> um, uh, I hope everyone can see my screen. Yes, we can. OK, okay so okay, today I'm going to be talking about some noteworthy trends in web development. Um, there are a few um, like main topics that have been out there, but I'm going to talk only about a few. So let's go through our agenda for today. First off, I'm going to go over an introduction on what I'll be talking about. Um, we'll first of all catch up with some latest tech news. Then we'll go over to the three main parts of our, of our discussion today, uh, which are responsive web design, single page applications, and progressive web apps. Then I'm going to close off by sharing some resources uh, that Rob will help me to share. So uh, let's dive in. Yeah. Um, so uh, web development is arguably the easiest entry into tech. And 
is a popular starting point for many aspiring tech professionals. And in recent years, uh, the field of web development missed significant advancements over the years for enhanced functionality. This was to meet the comprehensive demands for humans um, over the over time. And so today we'll talk about some of the development trends and in web development and what you can expect from them moving forward. But before we do, uh, let's catch up with some of the latest web news. Um, so for the web news, I'm actually talking about the 2023 Stack Overflow survey results. And specifically, the programming languages that top the charts that were used by professional developers. And as you can see here on the top of the list, we have JavaScript, followed by HTML and CSS, and that was Python. And um, JavaScript stopped the list. I mean, it runs on all browsers, uh, on all devices, both mobile phones and desktop. So it kind of makes sense that it's at the top. <clears throat> but what's really impressive is that, um, according to Danny Thompson and its facts, JavaScript has been topping the list for 11 years in a row. And Can I mean, I 11 years. Yeah. Can I pause you there for just a moment, Patrick? Because I wanted to make a note about this. So we get a lot of students and like newcomers okay. in the tech industry who ask us during like mentorship and stuff like that, um, what should I focus on first? There's so many things, there's so many technologies, so much literature for me to consume. Um, how am I gonna compare it to somebody who has like a computer science background? What should I learn first? And often I'll suggest, you know, getting familiar and comfortable with JavaScript. And it looks like you found some data on this, that it's been the most popular, trendy programming language and technology that people should be learning uh, to help build their projects. So this is awesome that you have that kind of affirmation. Yeah, JavaScript is really awesome. I mean, it has been tough for a long time, and that speaks to how powerful it is, since you can like really build a lot of things. It's not limited to just websites. You can work on desktop apps with Electron.js. You can even do some machine learning code with JavaScript. So it's, yeah, it's a very powerful language. Yeah, so let me continue. So <clears throat> in essence, um, my point is that investing your time in learning about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, the fundamentals of web development, it will definitely pay off later on in your career. So let's go over this quote that I found interesting. It says that web development is a mix of logic, creativity, and problem solving. It's like solving a puzzle that keeps evolving. And I know uh, by Jennifer Robbins, I know it sounds a bit frustrating, solving a puzzle that keeps evolving, but if you truly enjoy solving that puzzle, you'll be like relieved that it's, it never ends. And uh, in essence, uh, the good thing about building a website is that it's never really finished. You can always keep improving and adding new features. So, yeah, and with that, let's dive in into our first uh, topic for today, which is responsive web design. And what is responsive web design, you ask? Uh, responsive web design refers to an approach in web development that aims to create websites that adapt and respond to the user's device and screen size. So long story short is the approach where one website fits all screen sizes, whether it be a desktop view, a mobile view, it will still fit and the content will be displayed uh, without any hitches or problems. And with the increasing use of mobile devices and tablets to access the internet, it has become essential for websites to provide an optimal viewing and interaction experience across the various devices. So a practical example is the blog website. And as you can see here, this is the website in the desktop view. And uh, on the top, you can see we have some important links, important links at the top in a horizontal line. And then we have also a secondary horizontal line just below the, the top list. And when you 
take a look at the mobile and tablet view, you can see the design is a bit different. For the mobile view, we have the the top links have been replaced with the with a hamburger menu icon. Uh, it's called a hamburger menu icon because these three horizontal lines re re resemble the hamburger food item. Uh, same case with the tablet view, they are replaced with the menu icon. So if in if you are to click on this icon, the links that you saw there before in the desktop view would be displayed nicely. So yeah, uh, that is that is responsive web design, just a website adapting to different screen sizes. Let's move on to single page applications and see what they're about. So single page applications, AKA SPAs, are web applications that load and run entirely within a single web page, eliminating the need for page reloads or full page transitions. And the, of course, they provide a seamless user experience, similar to native desktop or mobile applications. So um, in the past, how websites used to work, you'd send a request to the server, and if you were to click a link within the website, the whole website would refresh. If you were to click another link, it would refresh. And what you'd get with this were multiple refreshes and it was a bit annoying for the user. And so this uh, style of developing websites came about developing single page applications. And using an, a nice image, what happens is under the hood is that first the user accesses the website um, and then the web bundle will be loaded into the site. So the HTML, CSS and JavaScript will be loaded and then there's a JavaScript program within this bundle that will access the data for, for you from the web server and load all the data dynamically to, to your site. And this happens because the websites are usually built uh, using components. Uh, components are just building blocks of the web. They kind of look like this. So you can have at the top a few nav bars, and then here in the middle you have the main content. <clears throat> and let's say you were to click a link here, only the, the middle part would change, and the top nav bar, and let's say you have a foot at the bottom. Uh, they will still remain static. Only the middle part will dynamically change. So yeah, all this will happen without the need to reload or refresh the entire website. Um, yeah, so some good examples of single page applications. We have Gmail. Um, uh, let's say uh, you have an incoming message in your inbox. Um, <clears throat> you'll see the messages coming in, but you won't have to refresh the website. Uh, same case with sending an email to someone. Uh, you'll send an email and not the entire web page will to reload. So that's a nice example of single page applications. You also have Twitter. Uh, for example, the Twitter website, you can like a tweet or retweet another tweet, and uh, you'll only see the that particular change happening dynamically. Let's say there was 100 likes. When you like it, then it comes to one, 101 likes that change will happen without the need to reload the entire web page. Other good examples are GitHub and Facebook. And uh, single page applications usually have the benefits. Uh, they're really powerful. Uh, one of the benefits is increased performance. And by reducing the amount of data sent between the server and the client, uh, SPAs can improve performance because only the essential data is retrieved and updated, not the entire, not the entire website. Um, then you'll have faster development speed because uh, the developers can have a separation of front-end and back-end concerns. Uh, this implies that developers may concentrate on creating the front-end user interface rather than worrying about the back-end infrastructure. And all in all, we have better user experience. And by minimizing the amount of full page reloads that are required for each interaction, SPAs create a more seamless user experience. And as a result, the application is faster 
and more responsive because users do not have to wait for the complete page to refresh every time they interact with it. So yeah, that's all about single single page applications. They fully function without the need for a page reload. Uh, next up, we have progressive web apps. And what are progressive web apps, really? Um, progressive web apps, aka PWAs, are a type of web application that is designed to provide a user experience similar to native mobile apps while being accessible through a web browser on various devices. Um, long story short, uh, progressive web apps are just websites or web applications that look and behave like mobile apps. Yeah, that's the simplest explanation. And they are designed to work across different platforms. And one of this is one of the, one of the biggest benefits, cross-device compatibility. Since they use well, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, which are compatible with all the browsers out there, and if they are compatible with the browsers, and let's say the device has a browser, it will work on all platforms. So you don't have the need to worry about uh, a programming language for a particular operating system or another. You just focus on one website, a single code base, working for all devices. Yeah, they also provide features such as offline functionality, push notifications, and the ability to be installed on the user's home screens features that are not usually available with the normal websites and web applications. I have and a question for some you. Some examples of... Oh, sorry, Patrick. Yeah. I have a question for you. So as you've introduced progressive web apps um, and you know, speaking on how it's compatible across different technologies, like whether you're using the Chrome browser or the Safari browser, like these web apps should be able to handle um, all of those changes and their programming language should be compatible across. What is the difference between progressive web apps and responsive web design? Because I'm sure that's something that students might be wondering. Yeah, so uh, responsive web design is typically uh, an approach, a development style for uh, making all, all websites to fit across all, or, 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 all devices, sorry. So we have devices like uh, mobile phones, we have tablets, and we have websites you can even have like smart tvs so responsive web design aims to fit that website across all devices just to fit and adapt for example in the example i provided earlier the links at the top switch to one menu icon that fits in a home in a mobile phone but for progressive web apps that whole experience in a website is then turned into a native mobile app. So while navigating through the PWA, you'll feel like you're using a mobile app. You have like features like offline functionality, which are not available in websites. You also have um, push notifications, etc. So uh, a good example is the Twitter light. If maybe you have used the Twitter light, um, if you install it, it's usually a small bundle. Uh, about 5 MB is very, very low uh, bundle. And when you click it, uh, normally it's supposed to redirect you to a browser, or you can also install it on your home screen. But essence, in essence, it's a website or a web application. But when you navigate through it, it's like a mobile app. Yeah. For responsive web design, you can fit it into a tablet or a, yeah, or a smart TV, but for progressive web apps, it will look like a native mobile app and have all the features. Yeah, yeah so it sounds like uh, with responsive web design, uh, that kind of approach accounts for different screen real estate, right? Like it should be able to transfer over different screen sizes and things like that and still be readable and usable. Um, and then with the progressive web apps, it's considering the different technologies you could be using to access the application. Um, so that's fascinating. Thank you for sharing more details on that. Yeah, welcome. So uh, there's uh, uh, some good examples of progressive web apps. Uh, as I said, we have Twitter Lite, which is a lightweight version of the Twitter app. Um, we also have Pinterest. It's also a PWA that looks and feels and behaves like a mobile app, 
but in essence the web application a progressive web application um, another good example is facebook lite yeah facebook lite is also a pwa so yeah um moving forward um what's next for these technologies um for responsive web design there has been some debates going on about which is the best style to use uh, between mobile first responsive design or desktop first responsive design for mobile first it implies that you start designing from the mobile approach and then you go on adjusting until it fits the desktop and for the desktop it's vice versa um in my opinion honestly there is no right or wrong answer both are correct since you still get the desired output it will be responsive and uh, but mo the mobile first design is popular than the desktop so yeah that's good there's there are some good things about responsive web design for single page applications um they have a wide range of support from popular frameworks for example we have angular Vue.js, we have react although react is a library but it still supports single page applications. We have Ember.js, we have Backbone.js. So these popular frameworks support the development of single page applications and it has proven to be useful. And that's why the, the frameworks are incorporating this type of web development. For progressive web apps, um, since it's, uh, as I said, the biggest benefit of progressive web apps, is that they are cross-device compatible. You don't have to think about uh, writing a new mobile app using a different set of tools and programming languages. Um, you can just use the HTML and CSS and JavaScript already available in a single code base, um, fine tune some things, add some technologies to make it a progressive web app, and it will work on all devices. Um, for example, you can have uh, an app use, used in an operating system like Android, you'll use Kotlin. Let's say you built it using Kotlin. And so you want the iOS users to also experience the app. You'll have to switch to another language like Swift to program it. But with progressive web apps, there's no need for that. And of course, there are some uh, programming languages in mobile development that are cross-platform, but uh, the PWS approach is more effective since you won't use another programming language. You're still using the plain HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and everything will work fine. So um, moving forward, I compiled a list of resources that uh, I see I have deemed that will be very useful for you. Um, Robbie, could you please share the screen? Yes, this? sir. So let's see. I have Patrick's repository up here. Let me just share this up here. And we will toggle this one off. Great. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'll just go through them quickly. So I created a list for responsive web design. We have a brief intro about what it is. Um, I listed some articles related to the topic and also some video articles for responsive web design. Also listed some uh, helpful articles on single, single page applications, a small definition, and then some articles and video resources. Um, then we have progressive web apps, a small definition, and then some helpful articles, and then some helpful video resources. I didn't exhaust the list, but I compiled a list that would, would set the stage and would um, give you a strong foundation if you want to further your learning in these three topics. So yeah, also put in a list of additional resources to kickstart your web development journey. And a small bonus, uh, feel free to take a look <laughs> and enjoy the content. This is some yeah. great, this is a great uh, .md. Uh, it looks like you have a lot of really helpful resources and links linked in here. I appreciate that you put it all in one repository because if we were to share every one of those links, 
Um, it might be overwhelming for folks. I like that you organized it into these three different things that you think would be very helpful for students, and I'm sure that it is. So I've shared uh, a link to Patrick's repository in the chat for folks to check out. Awesome. Okay. Um, let me wind up, uh, summarize what you've talked about. Uh, yeah, JavaScript is there to stay, mm, meaning investing your time learning about the fundamentals will definitely pay off. Um, responsive web design is uh, just uh, the approach where websites adapt to user devices and screen sizes. Uh, single page applications are web applications that do not require a reload when navigating through it. And progressive web apps, uh, simplest definition, websites that look like mobile apps. End of my talk. Thank you for um, being here and joining this talk. If you'd like to connect, uh, these are my links. Yeah, my GitHub and my LinkedIn. Feel free to ask questions regarding these topics, and I will be happy to help. Over awesome. to you, Ruby. I uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Patrick. That was really insightful. It sounds like you had a lot of information prepared for our students. Um, so I'm sure there's going to be folks who are watching right now and getting what they need out of it. But we also have these recordings of our live streams forever on YouTube and on LinkedIn. Um, so if you ever want to go back and, you know, slow down in some places or grab some links, you can do that as well moving forward. So I'll stop sharing your screen here, Patrick and pass it on to Pradumna here, because I know Pradumna has some developer workflows and trends that he wants to share as well. Absolutely. Yes, let me switch my screen to like this tab. Yeah, no worries. I see you over on the side, so I'll toggle it on when you're ready. Absolutely. So while Pradumna is having that prepared, something I did uh, point out in the chat, um, Patrick had mentioned libraries and frameworks. And I know so that some folks get those two confused. Um, so I added a note here that libraries and frameworks do have some differences where frameworks basically provide everything for a developer to build out an application. So you think about React, it's got um, its own system of creating web applications. And if you abide by that and uh, you follow through with the framework, then you're able to build an entire application just based off of uh, React. Uh, but with a software library, um, this is like a suite of data or code that you can reuse to develop a program or an application on your own. So it gives you a little bit more control over what you're building and how you're building it, but it has some reusable aspects to it. So um, installing packages and things like that, there could be libraries in there that you're calling upon in your code. Um, so that kind of like inversion of control really is the difference between a framework and a library. So if anyone was curious, that is what's going on there. Awesome, so I have Padumna's share here on the side. I'm going to put that up right now. Take it away, Padumna. Let us know what's going on. I hope you are able to see my screen. Yes. Yeah, so like uh, today we'll got covering like two, two different topics, like best practices and like automating tedious tasks with the GitHub Actions, which is CI CD workflow. So like first we like jump into like open source best practices. And uh, today we will not, not look at the API development, uh, not consumption cycle. Now, what I mean by consumption cycle is that like using the API, like using the, I want to say, uh, uh, Pokemon's API. We will not look into that documentation thing and everything. We will mostly look into how the back, back thing was like developing the API, like the workflow thing, the, uh, the testing thing and those stuff. So yeah, like I will just switch to uh, one of my repositories, like to give you a good like overview, like what can be a good practices for a uh, uh, when when you're open sourcing your API or not not API in general, like any repositories, like if you're open sourcing your code, like uh, like it can be a website, or it can be API. But I, today we will focus more on the API side of things. So this is one one of my APIs, like which is, which is probably available like free to use, like name as open source API, like it resonates with that. So yeah, so like basic stuff, like uh, uh, like about the development of the API, like more than development means the improving the features, fixing the bugs and everything. I think one of the key aspects like uh, where we struggle is that like the uh, 
uh, actually bringing the api locally and developing that so i will like first best practices that support multi development what i mean by multi development environment like for example you are your project uh, your project is on node 16 but uh, a person using node 18 so there might be some dependencies which are not compatible with your local system uh, this is the this is the only thing i tell uh, tell about node but it can be possibly like the person uh, want to just use the api like the uh, back thing not the front thing like the development of the api but uh, they use a python but they want to install uh, that api but having multiple environments allowed to them to do that like uh, using docker you can see i have multiple environments for that like you can set up with the git pod or use a docker compose or just do the local setup what this allows is that if if a person just want to test out this repository they does not need to set up this whole step locally like installing the node then uh, cloning the repository and then testing out the apis and, and installing a bunch of dependencies they can use this two routes like get pod thing it's uh, what to say uh, cloud ie id which set up your development environment in ide like in a cloud and you can just use that Uh, like your vs code thing just in clouds and docker compose if you are familiar with the docker like this will run inside your uh, containers and the best thing about the container is that uh, the every dependencies and everything is uh, what to say installed inside a container so your local system does not affect that and for those th- i have already like written the configuration like you can see uh, i have a docker compose file over here and about the git pod uh, i have a git pod file over here this is the first practice like supporting multi de- development environment like just to ease down the development cycle for a end user or for example if a person want to contribute he can easily set up the environment and uh, like improve the uh, api fixing the bugs and everything like second thing is that having a contribution guidelines this is the necessity because if someone is uh, you can see over here i have a contributing dot md over here this is uh, another necessary point because if someone is come to your repository uh, it's good to uh, give them a heads up what this repository specific needs are that might be a possibility that person knows about the python but your api is uh, your api is built on javascript so having a clearly state that helps a lot like a contributor or a person uh, will save their time they can just see the prerequisite and they can move on if they don't want to because it might be a possibility that they have certain different tech stacks or different knowledge and having on the readme as well adds add lots of value because for example uh, uh, in general you will see okay this is a javascript project but if you see this also have like three or four te- technologies and uh, a certain per- certain person can be good on certain technology a person might be a good on mongodb so he, uh, he or she can add value on mongodb side someone can be good on testing side so a person who know the uh, person will know oh this uh, repository also have testing so i can contribute on this side so having clearly state what technologies and you are using and what like uh, what are the prerequisite helps a lot for a contributor as well as you and i think like uh, this is uh, what is a key aspect i uh, is missing in almost every repositories like uh, like uh so some people uh, jump on the repositories to report bugs and easing down uh, easing down that process is also very necessary because sometimes it can be overwhelming so uh, github has a good support for pr templates and issue templates what i mean by that when you go on the issues if you see uh, a normal repositories they have just blank issue templates you can see it will look like this but what happen is that it's really hard to figure out what actual information you are asking for like uh, sometimes you ask for what uh, what is your development environment or what runners you are using or what is a node version so you can separate different templates so that a person coming to your repository want to report anything like or request for anything uh, they can just ju- just select any templates like for example uh, a person want to report a bug you can just click on the uh, bug section and there is a, sep- uh, a two separate section uh, the person can put the description and a screenshot of the bug so this is helps a lot like both on the maintainer side and the contributor side they feel like more welcoming like they ease down the process for their reporting bug or asking for any documentation sorry asking for any features you can see we have a uh, template for request or feature request so uh, description and so something similar like on the lines like having issue template similar things can be go for like pr templates like when raising a pr if, so 
uh, you like some repositories have basic guidelines so you can put your guidelines over here say so, so every time a person opens a pr no so this guideline should be followed or this code should this like what to say this uh, uh, practices should be followed so the, it can reduce a lots of communication and uh, improve lots of like time between your pr and the like the actual code getting merged and uh, like one key aspect like uh, i want to share is like the security policy this is a new addition to the github this sometimes like this happens uh, happens like for example if your code has some vulnerabilities but raising issue can be more vulnerable because when you raise an issue it get raised on the public you can see this are the pre old issues but when you raise an issue it is on the public side so when you ex when you tell your loopholes on the public side some person can use those loopholes and play against you so sometimes vulnerabilities are best to report privately so uh, if you have a it, uh, it's it is good to have a security policy so the, the, uh, what i mean by security policy is that this are mostly for reporting the excessive vulnerabilities like the very uh, severe vulnerabilities which can be really a harmful for the api or any project like may, might be data leaking might be a privacy leaking so uh, if a person come to the issues he will also get he or she will also get a policy over here like a report of vulnerabilities so this is a cool, this is a really good thing like uh, certain kind of issues can be reported privately so that maintainers or the owner can have a quick, quick fix over there and one of the last thing i would uh, mention over here is that the the uh, security aspect but it is a secret scanning so every developers like work with the environment variables like mongodb url it can be next or url anything so uh, the uh, github also recently added a secret scanning uh, this is also a good thing like uh, uh, because this is this api is hosted on bursel and i am using like mongodb and some other environment variables so sometimes like uh, i we know like we use the get, get ignore and dot env files to do that still but there can be certain times like uh, by mistake you deleted the get ignore or something like that so github add a get, github adds a, a functionality where you can uh, enable your secret scanning and for enabling that you can go on settings and go on secrets and uh, sorry you can go on secrets and okay they have changed the uh, sorry uh, okay you can head over to code security and you can see over here you can enable uh, yeah secret scanning over from here so every time like you push a secret so it will it will like firstly there are two types of two types of like secret scanning like it first it will push then tell you like this secret has been found and second there's a push prediction it will not allow you even to push to the repository so this is a good thing like uh, even though you are using with environment variables or not keep this enabled it will save your tons of time and uh, and i i see tons of uh, projects uh, pushing their aws key and G gcp cloud keys so this is a good protection over there so yeah uh, that's about the more on the uh, what to say good pra good practices side and like some more things like can we talk about like get a license uh, get a code of contact like code of contact is uh, also necessary like uh, uh, like for example like someone is like misbehaving with your code or misbehaving with your community and everything you can report them and see i talk about the security policy and licensing yeah that's it and have a good read me and yeah like uh, moving forward like share the screen like uh, about the automating tds tasks what i mean by uh, tds tasks so uh, we will use the get up workflow like what i mean by tds tasks is like this three things like uh, like we like to develop code but we all we generally don't like the test thing like formatting and linting thing what i mean what i mean by this three things like testing thing is like uh, testing the functionality of the apis like uh, functions and the uh what to say end date uh, like uh, it can be unit testing or it can be whole uh, website testing it can be anything like testing in general like formatting on the code side like uh, like if you see some bigger repositories have a trend to format their code in certain way what i mean by formatting like if you heard about pre tier like it formats the code a little bit better like for readability and maintaining purposes and linting is uh, Uh, some people use linter some people don't use linter so linter uh, what does the linter do is that like sometimes 
you declare the variable but you does not provided the uh, type of variable like if uh, like just you put on the variable name and just you assign the value so this can be sometimes uh, bad practice because some runners don't understand if you don't provide the const or variable or like anything like let which we generally use in the javascript ecosystem so linters find those uh, like issues like uh, uh, like uh, it can be any issues like sometimes you import, uh, you just uh, use a function but did not import it the package you uh, use a function but did not return the statement so linter find those issues and let you know or oh, these are the issues you have to fix them so yeah uh, so we will like also have a look about that yeah so to just have a uh, Uh, what to say? Demo of that. I will just create a test branch for that. So, yeah. So, what we will do is that uh, first we will like just see the workflows. Like I talk about the Jupyter workflows. So you can see uh, I have a lint test over here, like uh, testing a lint, uh, lint test over here. So what what we uh, do in the Jupyter workflow? Like Jupyter flow workflow is a set of actions. Actions in the main. Is, uh, means you can see uh, in general uh, like action like do this do that like you can see over here this is action like uh, we are running node over here we are installing the dependencies so there are different steps these are called steps and when we use a certain work uh, already build code like this are called actions like check out action or set up in the node because these are already pre built things these are called actions and we can easily use them in workflow to ease down things and uh, you can see over there it's uh, very uh, understandable first we are check out means like cloning the repositories uh, yet uh, let's uh, go one step back like for example we are here we are setting up a environment like first you are we are setting up the ubuntu and here we are checking out the code and just we are copying the environment variables and we are setting up the node and we are installing the dependencies and we are using the linter to Test the linting and npm test to run the test. So these are the commands which we have declared in the package dot json. If if I head back, let me give you overview. You can see over here. Let me zoom a little bit. You can see uh, we have tests over here. We are testing with the Mocha and for the linting, we are using the ESLint. So when runner will uh, when we uh, run the npm run lint. it will run the es lint and when the runner like workflow with workflow will run the test it will run the mocha test and the files we have in the test like we i already have some tests over here so it will run those tests so for a, a brief overview like how this works let me head over to index.js and and just uh what to say just add some bunch of lines to uh, what to say Uh, uh like uh, destroy the formatting like uh, uh what to say the usual formatting we generally don't do spacing and everything so just uh turning down the uh, formatting and we just do a commit change and what we will do we will raise this we will raise a pr with that and you can see over here let me just open a pull request i will not fill up anything just for testing purpose you can see over here like every time a pr runs like it will run several things like formatting unit testing and critics and you can understand with that like uh, like currently this is a single pr but in the uh, like when the repository repository get bigger it's really hard to test out each and everything manually and this can be tedious this is what i mean by tedious like Test, testing each and everything manually, like testing the things, formatting the things, and linting the things. This all are done by the GitHub Actions. Like I automated that task. I just set up the workflow. These are the steps you need to do, and the GitHub Action is doing that. You can see uh, we have the wrong formatting, and GitHub Actions fix, fix those formatting. I, when I click over here, you can see it deletes all the line and just make the code look much better. so i now i don't need to just bring this on local my own my own local system and fix the formatting no now now get up actions do each and everything for that you can see uh, we don't have any files because we just added the space uh, now let's test the linting thing like what i mean by linting and the breaking of the code let me go back and uh, just 
do the test. For them, while you're pulling that up, um, I do want to emphasize that that was a great demonstration and a good uh, highlight of your point that we don't have to go through that tedious testing like you mentioned. Um, that if you're using a tool like GitHub Actions in your workflow, that you can simplify so many different processes. Um, so now it looks like you're getting into linting. I can't wait to see what that looks like. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so so let me just get back to the formatting thing once more. So what happened is that, like, uh, uh, this pull request get empty because uh, we uh, fix those issues, like, fix those empty lines. This is why this is uh, showing up empty. So what happened is that, like, for example, if a person opens this uh, PR, and uh, you can understand the unnecessary conversation, like, by what is it? Like, you saw this person has a, like, bunch of, like, blank lines, and we only change a single file, and it can be, like, hundreds of files, and person has, uh, uh, like, every, in every file, uh, they have, like, two or three blank lines. So it's really hard to go back and forth and tell the person, oh, reduce this, uh, remove this line, or remove that line. So... Uh, this GitHub Actions reduces that noise and just we are talking about more on the developing side, like giving that good feedback, not the unnecessary feedback. I tell this is unnecessary because uh, developers are meant to solve the problems, not doing the silly things like uh, linting things and PTN things. So uh, passing over the tedious tasks to the automation side. Yeah. So let me show an example of a, uh, what to say, linting thing. Uh, let me uh, go back to the file and just let's modify the index.js only. Okay, first let's use the branch because we are doing the changes on the main branch. Okay, okay. So let's, for a simple thing, let's break something like, okay, we just remove a dot and uh, j because if you uh, code this in JavaScript, you will get a squiggly line over here because this is not a valid code, not valid JavaScript code, but we can see over here. Like, uh, okay, just, uh, okay, let make it more understandable. Let's keep it at the, at is, and just remove the dot. So you can understand, this is really hard to figure out when a person raise a PR, because this is a simple dot, but this can break a whole code. So we just remove that dot and let's see how the, what, actions need what actions will how actions will like react and what actual problem the action will uh, like it gives and it gives a throws an error and we can solve according to that let's see that so like i did a change and you can see over here like again all the actions are running and let me just go back to uh, the workflows to give you give you an I, I I'm not diving that uh, diving into that much because it's a YAML configuration. I don't want to invest too much time over here, but give you a, a little bit much overview of that. Okay, sorry for that. Yeah. You can see over here, I have set a, a paths. What I mean by path over here is only run on JavaScript code. You can see I have uh, specifically configured only run push. We're pushing means and when you like get push and pull request what we are testing right now. So only runs when a JavaScript file is changed. This makes sense because your code is JavaScript and it does not make any sense to run, run this uh, work every time because this also uh, increases server time and also read, uh, leads to the card animation. So this is a kind of good practices in the GitHub actions. So yeah. So you can see over here, this all failed. Unit testing as well as failed and you can see our linter as well, uh, uh, also failed. We can head over to the linting thing and check what what the thing has been failed. You can see over here, it completely states that this is this console log is not defined. It clearly states. So this is a cool thing about the actions. It actually defines and actually point out which line is breaking and which lines which line need to be modified. And uh, and you can see there is a two check. There's a two check failing. The reason is that we have two separate things. I will just head, head over to that and show you as well. You can head over to actions. And uh, first thing is like uh, test because our test will also fail because uh, I, I think this is test. Okay, this is test, yeah. So the first, the, this linter has failed. And if you head over back and check the another file, uh, Okay, yeah, I'm not, not sure why it runs to, uh, uh, run twice. Completely not sure about that, but it should run one 
only one time that is uh, that is not an issue like it can be more, uh, on the my more on the my code side yeah so this is the thing i was talking about you can check over here as well it has is it is exactly shows like this error is coming from open source api dot in this dot js and it also says like console log is not defined so yeah this is what i am talking about the linting thing like uh, the the uh, yeah one more thing that you can see over there this thing pts does not fail because pts work did the job great because we have, don't have any linting issue you can see over here format works really great we have uh, run the formatting because uh, there is no issue on the formatting but issue is on the code side so this is why we have a separate things like one check for formatting one check for linting one check for unit testing something like that yeah hope that uh it's clear and yeah uh, let me do one more thing and let just fix that code for now okay okay we are the, again in the main branch let me switch back okay so like uh, as you commit like it will push those commit to the, like uh, sorry it will auto catch up those commit and rerun those testing or anything like you running like the rerun the unit testing rerun the formatting and everything so yeah now now this time it will pass one thing i uh, want to touch upon more like uh, when we build apis it's a good practice to add testing because you can't test manually test each and every time you do api change so i have written some tests for this api in mocha and chai this is uh, uh, what i use to test my apis and you can see i have written the test over here like uh, what showed or what is the expected um, response body so you can see my testing is working fine but i want to show up how i will break this testing as well for example in in in, in like you change uh, certain things like for example now instead of Two, okay, this is two hundred. Like, let me go. Yeah. So instead of like uh, this route API slash dev tips, now it started. You start change to two zero one. Like uh, it back used to give to two zero one code. Now it is changed to two zero two code. So what happened? Like when you change the code, change the functionality of the API, I would say. So this is a testing thing. So uh, we also run tests on the actions. We, I already show that here. You can see over here. We can, we also run tests over here. we run our test over here so run test so now this thing test should fail because our testing will not match because we are saying to uh, we are expecting a 201 with that test but we are getting a 202 because that was that time testing was passing you can see over here it is installing the dependencies again and again running the lint now the same yeah Okay. Awesome, Pradhan. I, yes, I do you. want to point out yes. that we are. Yeah, I do want to point out. Uh, yeah. Although these are amazing demonstrations, it's great to see how the tests are running and where we can find yeah. points that we're breaking. Um, we do want to, uh, you know, get into our shoutouts and our Kahoot game pretty soon. So if you have yeah. like any takeaways that you want to share, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I, I think my journey also complete. Just a one minute to like. I think that. Uh, every part is covered yeah sure thing so yeah so you can see over here like uh, uh, we are expecting 201 but we got the two uh, sorry we are expecting 200 but we got the 201 so yeah, i think that's it i covered like the three points about that yeah yeah thank you for that yeah no okay you can stop share you can stop sharing my screen now gotcha awesome um so pradhana that was is that uh you wrapped up your your demo there Did you have one more takeaway that you wanted to share? Yeah, the, I just want to uh, the takeaway. Uh, I would say like uh, automate the tedious task because uh, like once your repo started growing up, it's really hard to test out those things. Like the, I just pointed out three things. There can be like lots of things. Like you are running play right and everything. So uh, because uh, uh, it's really hard to bring those bring down those code locally and testing each and everything. Sometimes it can be fifty or hundred files just. Give your tedious tasks to the GitHub Actions and let it handle. And you focus more on the development and valuable feedback. Yeah, that's it. 
For sure. That's definitely a good practice. Wherever you can automate something, do that <laughs> just so that your your life is a little bit easier. And especially if you're going to be repeating things, um, anytime that you've repeated anything, that's an opportunity for an automation. Um, so that's good to keep in mind. I did throughout your presentation share some of those links that you had, like your repository. So if folks want to go in there and check out all of those different tests that Presumna has set up, you can do that as well. Um, I did have a couple of other trends I wanted to share with folks. We know AI and ML has been a really huge buzzword in the industry these days. Um, so it's definitely trending. If you are curious about using AI and ML APIs, we have the Postman API network. That's linked in the chat for you to check out. Um, so within our Explore tab up in Postman, you can go in there and search the categories for AI, and you'll find a whole slew of APIs that you can play around with. And then something else that folks are talking a lot about these days are low-code, no-code solutions. Um, so GitHub Copilot is one of those technologies that um, it'll pick up on patterns and comments that you're leaving in your code, and it'll suggest different code snippets to you, which is very helpful, and it's very trending these days, especially with AI taking off. Um, so if you want to check out GitHub Copilot, that link is in there as well to their documentation. But we also have an episode of this live stream where um, Stephen Torrance actually came on and helped us demo GitHub Copilot. So if you're curious about that, you can check our live stream playlist on YouTube and look for that video. And then Postman's low-code, no-code solution um, is provided through the Postman Flows feature. So if you want to check that out, there's a blog post in the chat as well. Awesome. So with that, let's actually shift into some shout outs as we're wrapping up our episode today. Um, it's 1111 my time. So it's a lucky number. Uh, definitely make a wish in your mind. <laughs> um, so something that I wanted to shout out was from a user named Yashpreet in our Discord server. So let me actually share our Discord server link really quickly for folks. Where'd you go, Discord? There it is. Okay. So that Discord link for you to join our community is up on the screen right now. So feel free to grab that. But I did want to shout out Yashpreet. He used um, the Share Your Work channel to show off his very first blog post on APIs. It's a great read. And we love seeing juniors and students taking huge steps like this to build up their online presence and their reputation um, through things like blog posts or being present on live streams and making videos on YouTube. Um, so big shout out to Yashpreet. Good job um, getting that blog post out and sharing it. If you're curious about Yashpreet's blog or you want to see what other folks are doing in our community, you are always welcome to join that Discord server to find out um, what they're up to and to share some of your own awesome work that we can shout out on our live streams. Um, but with that, I did want to ask uh, Patrick and Pr Pradumna if you have any shout outs for members of our community or members in the chat today. Feel free to share those. I'll pass it to Patrick first. Do you have any shout outs? <clears throat> um, yeah, I'd uh, like to shout out to all my friends yeah, who, are, who have been supporting me uh, in this developing journey. Yeah, yeah, thank you for the support, guys. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Pradumna, do you have any shout outs? Yeah, I, I, I want to give a shout out to everyone like who is contributing to open source and like a shout out to Patrick as well. Like, open sourcing their repository so that others can learn yeah. So anyone who is like involving in the open source system, a big shout out to them, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, open source is the name of the game here at Postman as well. We try to make everything open and visible to folks. Um, and Pradumna, I really appreciated during some of your demonstration how you mentioned that so sometimes when things are open source, um, if you don't have a really great security policy set up, folks can be using GitHub issues to expose vulnerabilities and things like that. Um, so great job sharing that as well. That was uh, something that I take for granted that I was glad that you brought up um, and is something to keep in mind too. Cool. Um, so those are some of our shout outs. Now we're going to kind of shift into what we love to do on our episodes. At the very end, we play a Kahoot game. So let me share my screen so you can see our Kahoot up here. Minimize some of these things so that you're not distracted. And yeah, I'll share my screen up here. Or not. <laughs> Let's see. There's the window. Great. And here it is. So I'm actually about to jump into the game. But before I do that, I do want to share that we have a Kahoot code. Um, so if you're not familiar with Kahoot, uh, it's a quiz game. 
that you can play for free with all of us right now live by logging into Kahoot.it on your phone or in your browser in another tab. But once you are in Kahoot.it, you're going to want to enter the code that you are about to see on your screen. So let me actually start the game and you'll see a code pop up on your screen. If you want to join in, go into Safari on your phone or whatever browser you're using and put in that code, which is 639-3720. Let me edit our caption here so that we can have that code in here as well. 9, 3, 7, 3. Awesome. So once you enter the game, you choose your name. And Parumna and Patrick, you are welcome to join in as well. Oh, we got Funny Chicken, Glad Meerkat. I am already in. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Let's see, some of these questions can throw folks for a, a loop. So let's see if you're able to answer them. We got someone thinking they're definitely gonna be able to answer all these questions. All right, let's see what the first one is. About how many Postman student leaders are there around the world? What do you think? Less than 10, over 500, over 100 or over 20? Hmm, this is something we mentioned in the very beginning. How many student leaders do you think there are? Ooh, the answer is over 100 student leaders worldwide. Nice, we got Glad Meerkat taking the lead. Funny chicken right after. True or false? You need a Postman Student Expert badge to become a student leader. Is that true? I don't know. Do you need that Student Expert badge to become a student leader? What do you think? Oop, Raduna's almost giving away the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Just a small hint. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, that's true. You do need your Student Expert badge to become a student leader. Glad Meerkat up on top with Funny Chicken following close behind and then Epic Chicken right behind them. Who were the guests on our previous episode in May? Was it Stephen Torrance from Handshake and Charles Watkins from Grammarly? Was it a few other student leaders, Clifford and Himanshu? Was it Tony, a CSN engineering student? Or was it Alexi from Postman? Who do you think was on our last episode in May? Ooh, correct. Clifford and Himanshu were on our very last episode. So if you check our playlist on YouTube, you'll see them on there. Glad Meerkat. Wow, destroying the game right now. Where can you learn more about Postman student programs? Which link do you think you should use? Hmm. This can be a tricky one. Awesome. We had one person thinking it was community.postman.com. That's actually our community forum. Nice. So we have Glad Meerkat as number one, our top chicken. And a few others were on the, on the pedestal there, but that went by really quickly. So I wasn't able to see them. Awesome. So I will exit out of this because that background sound from Kahoot always gets me <laughs> very confused. Awesome. So thank you so much, Patrick and Pradumna, for joining our stream today and for sharing so much of your knowledge and insight and your demonstrations, especially. Um, I know our student community is watching and they're learning and they have access to this later on. If they weren't able to catch up for some reason while we were live, they can always go back and rewatch. Um, so are there any closing thoughts that you want to share, Patrick or Pradumna? Um, not really. I'm um, good. Just uh, this, was, this was a very exciting session. I'll be looking forward to other sessions in future. Yeah. Have fun, everyone. Awesome. Pradham Nani. Yeah, I just want to. Yeah. Yeah, I was just saying that thank you for the wonderful stream and inviting us on this stream. And yeah, and 
anyone in the audience or watching after the stream have any doubts feel free to reach out in the discord community or on the socials everything everywhere anywhere like we feel comfortable to yeah, help out awesome and i did share patrick and pramna's uh socials so they had their different link trees i shared that in the chat as well so that'll be there on youtube and on linkedin and on twitch um so if you're revisiting this video you should be able to grab that link and then like pramna just mentioned we are all on discord as well so if you want to join that server um you can find our community there and reach out to us about anything any questions if you're stuck on the training anything else if you want to join events join a hackathon anything like that um and then one thing i forgot to mention is that we also have our linkedin showcase page so if you go into linkedin at this link you'll find all of our recent streams all of our blog posts and recent announcements things like that um so if you're just hanging around on linkedin anyway you might as well go see what's up on that showcase page Awesome, but with that, I will put up our transition and we are out of here. We'll see you hopefully next month for our next episode. Um but until then, good luck and have fun with your developer projects. See ya.